Stephen, will you help me by passing these out to everybody tonight? We're on part three of the church at Laodicea. That's in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. There you go. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Now, perhaps I should have waited to pass these out because I know what's going to happen. As I start preaching, Stephen, I tell you what, you hold on to them. <laughs> yes, hold on to them right now. You can, you can just sit, hold on to them. Just don't pass them out yet. Yeah, just don't pass them out yet. Uh, because uh, otherwise, I know what will happen. You all will be reading. Yes, and she's pouting. She's the only one that got one. Uh, he'll be reading this while I'm trying to preach. <laughs> we'll be referring to it in a few moments, but uh, don't look at it yet. Okay, we're over in Revelation. We're in chapter 3, looking at verses 14 through 22. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at part 2 of the church at Laodicea. Last week, we had a fifth Sunday special, the DVD Audacity, Love Can't Stay Silent, and tonight, we're back at the church of Laodicea, part 3. Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I have that thou art cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What the Spirit saith unto Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power. As we look at ourselves and as we look at the church in the United States, to a great extent we see Laodicea. We're rich, we think. We have no need of anything, we think. We're increased with goods, we think. And we're neither hot nor cold. We're lukewarm. We have no zeal for Christ. We're never going to bend to make the little extra effort to be here and participate. Luke Warren. Saved, but Luke Warren. Jesus says he'll spit us out. Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word tonight that it will bring conviction of sin that will work in our hearts true repentance not to be repented of. 
that you might teach us what it means to be on fire for Christ, that you would teach us what it means to be lukewarm when we think we're hot or cold, and yet we've only deceived ourselves. Father, bless your word as it goes forth tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right before the church at Laodicea, we looked at the church at Philadelphia. That was a faithful church. That was a missionary church. We've talked about the different levels at which we can view the seven churches of Asia Minor. And we see that one of those levels is as we look at church history, it parallels very closely what has happened from the days of the apostolic church down to the day in which we live. The missionary church, the faithful church, most closely parallels the time period from the Great Awakening in America through the beginning of the 1960s, when certainly here in America, the church took a definite turn toward the character qualities of the church at Laodicea. And so it comes right before Laodicea. After great times of spiritual victory, after great times of spiritual motivation, after great times of spiritual power, the church tends to sit on its laurels. Now this happened all through church history, but in terms of the broad expanse of church history, we see we've moved into that period of time where the church is looking back at all the great successes of the past. And we're delighted to hear stories of missionaries on the foreign field having accomplishments while we ourselves sit at home and think that we're fine. Philadelphia was humbly serving Christ. Laodicea was proudly conforming to the world. That's the church in America today. We are so occupied with conforming to the world that we forget what it means to serve Christ. We think we've served Christ by showing up once or twice a week at church, and so we've done our duty. We think we've served Christ when perhaps as we're drinking our cup of coffee and glancing at the newspaper over on the side, we read a couple of Bible verses uh, at breakfast before we bolt out the door. We think we're serving Christ if perhaps somebody next to us swears and we look at them with a pained expression. What does it mean to serve Christ? When someone is a baby, they can't do much. They certainly can't help dad mow the grass or help mom wash the dishes or help clean the house or even take the dog for a walk. But as children grow, <clears throat> and this is gonna be a major theme of ours tonight, the Lord willing, as children grow, it transforms the way in which they interact with the world around them. When a Bible-believing Christian begins to grow, you gotta be saved first. And to be saved, you have to believe what the Bible says about Jesus, who he is and what he did. But as a Christian grows, it transforms his life and he begins to do certain things that characterize spiritual growth. Did you notice what Jesus said first to the church at Laodicea? I know thy works. If Jesus was standing in front of me tonight, he'd say, Christian, I know thy works. The good ones, the bad ones. I know how you're spending your time. I know how you're spending your resources. I know how you're spending your energy. I know everything that you've done when you were married and how you interacted with your wife. 
I know how when your children were born, what you did to build into their lives or did not build into their lives. I know every time you got a paycheck what you did with it. I know how many times your mind wandered to things where it should not have wandered. I know every time you witnessed. I know the people you led to Christ, they're precious to me. But I know the times you didn't witness when I gave you opportunity even to give a gospel tract and you chose not to do it. I know the things that went through your head when you made choices. I saw each time you took the right fork instead of the left. I saw each time you took the left fork instead of the right. I know thy works. I saw every book you read. I saw every magazine you read. I saw every newspaper you read. I saw every film you saw. I heard every response that you gave. Some carnal, as well as those that were godly. I know thy works. Not just the works that were done now that you're older. I know every time that you as a child disobeyed your mother. I know every time as a child you disobeyed your father. I know every time as a child that you were cruel to your brother or sister or some other little friend. I know every time that you seared your conscience. Every time you refused to repent. Every time you were arrogant or proud. I know everything that you ever did. That's how Jesus speaks to the church at Laodicea. I know, I don't have to guess, I don't have to scratch my head and try to think of it, I don't have to go back and flip through a few pages, he's God, he's omniscient, I know by works. Not just I know your faith, I know thy works. Not just I know you're saved, I know thy works. Not just I know the good things about you, I know thy works. Tonight Jesus says it to you. And he tells us what Laodicea was like. At the specific point in history when this letter was written. I know the times that you said you weren't feeling well and so you didn't come to church. I know the times that you had something that you thought was more important than being in church. I know the times where you had family events that you counted more precious than your fellowship with me. I know the times when you made the excuses verbally, trying to convince others as well as yourself that what you were doing is right. I know the times that you made the sacrifice and the times that you chose the flesh and sloth. I know thy works. Dear friends, that should be perhaps the scariest warning to us of all as we look at their works and begin to ask ourselves the question, are we hot for Christ? Are we enthusiastically, energetically pursuing his service in the body of Christ? Every member of the body 
is critically essential to every other member of the body. And when we fail in our responsibilities, it not only brings sorrow to the Lord Jesus Christ, it brings damage to the body of Christ. We're going to talk about fellowship tonight because that's what this passage is about. Jesus knocking. If anybody hears his voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. I'll have dinner with him. That reminds us of the Lord's table. That reminds us of fellowship, the things we have in common. That reminds us of Jesus before the cross and Jesus on the road to Emmaus where he went in and broke bread and their eyes were opened and he vanished from their sight. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And the very next thing he says is in verse 21, to him that overcometh, overcomes what? Overcomes the lukewarm, lazy, laissez-faire type of attitude of, well, it doesn't really matter. It's like government work. I'll get paid whether or not I do a good job or a bad job. To him that overcometh, you've got to overcome an attitude. You've got to overcome a mindset. You have to overcome a body set of sloth and laziness if you're going to be either hot or cold. Jesus does not spit out the hot. Jesus does not spit out the cold, but Jesus spits out the lukewarm. Philadelphia was humbly serving Christ. Laodicea was proudly conforming to the world. We read this passage here and see that they were arrogant. They were proud. They were rich. Those are three words that clearly define the church in America today and perhaps segments of this church. We talked about Gnosticism being rampant in Laodicea at this period of history and apparently the church had gotten into that. All the secret stuff. But because of their worldly success, the Laodiceans were in direct opposition to what Paul taught in Romans 12 about not conforming to the world. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's got to start there, folks. You're going to have to make some decisions. Unless you make a decision to be hot or cold, you will remain lukewarm. Otherwise, you will be conformed to the world. <clears throat> you must make a decision. We all know that in relation to salvation. Either you trust Christ or you don't trust Christ. Many times when I've shared the gospel with different people, at the end of the conversation, I've said to them, when I leave here, you're going to make a decision. Either you will trust Christ or you will not trust Christ. Those are your only two options. I've given you what is necessary to be saved. I've told you who Jesus is. I've told you what he did. I've told you that if you believe on him alone, you will have the gift of eternal life. Now, you're going to make a decision about that information. It's not enough to have it in your head. You must make a decision. And yes, I believe in the sovereignty of God. But I also believe in the commission that Christ gave to us to tell others the good news. I don't know who's among the elect. They don't have purple polka dots on their head. They don't have green stripes down their back. They don't have orange hair, though some of them may nowadays. I've given a commission 
to tell people that Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that by trusting in him they'll have eternal life. Romans chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4. It's who Jesus is, what he did. Only the Christ of scriptures can save you. You make a decision. All of you who are saved made that decision at some point. But you also make another decision here. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're going to make a decision either to be hot or cold, because if you make no decision, you will be lukewarm. It starts in the mind, but it doesn't end in the mind. He says in verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That was the problem at Laodicea. They thought very highly of themselves. But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. A few verses later in Romans chapter 12, Paul tells how it will transform your life. How it will transform your life in relation to yourself. How it will transform your relationship to others. How it will transform your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's still talking about the mind. But he's talking about a transformation that takes place because of a decision that you've made to either be hot or cold. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Remember, the problem with Laodicea was they were proud. He dealt with that back in verses 1 through 3. Now he says, the mind you need is the mind of humility. Not to think better of yourself than others. And here's what it'll do. One of the very first things that it will do to transform your actions. Recompense to no man evil for evil. I'm going to get back with them. Ah, they did bad on me. I'm going to do bad on them. Provide things honest in the sight of men. Oh, there's some positive things that transform in your life. Provide things honest in the sight of men. You're going to live an honest life and others are going to understand it and know it. Wow, the next one is a tough one. And that's why Paul says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, because he knows some people are going to have a really rough time with this, live peaceably with all men. Some people are really hard to live peaceably with. Some of them, no matter how peaceably you live, they're going to try to stone you. <laughs> That's what Paul was watching when the Jews stoned Stephen. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You see, there are going to be some transformations that take place in your life when you make the decision to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to control your thoughts. But it's not just you're not going to get even and you're not going to get mad. Look at verse 20. There's some positive things, how it will transform your life. And none of this was happening at Laodicea. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. I know thy works. I know thy works. There is a total abstention from any commendation to Laodicea. He didn't say, you got all these things, but, but you've been kind of good because you were helping someone uh, who had just become a Christian and so you wanted to, you know, help them in the body of Christ. No. Here Paul says, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. 
The Apostle John also taught clearly against the worldliness that we see at Laodicea. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 and following, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. You learned that when you first got saved. Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again. I believe in him. I have eternal life. Little children, that's the little kid stuff. Remember, we're going to be talking about spiritual growth. Laodicea had been Christians a long time, but they had no growth. They had become stagnant. They had become lukewarm. And Jesus says, I know your works. Little children, what do they know? Because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you fathers. Ah, there's some full-grown ones. Because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because... You have known the Father. I can remember my little kids running up to me and saying, Abba, Abba. <laughs> and I'd pick them up, maybe two years old, and they would give me a big hug around my neck. They were so happy to see me. You know what? Those were delightful times. But I would be mortified if today they were still running around in diapers and running over and saying, Abba, Abba. And that was about all they could say and expecting me to pick them up. These 200-pound boys or 130-pound girls trying to pick them up. There are things that belong to little children. There are things that belong to fathers. There are things that belong to young men. And John writes about those. And he tells us, love not the world. That was the key problem at Laodicea. If you love the world, you are from Laodicea. If you love the things of the world, you are Laodicea. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Laodicea was the little children, but they had lost their love for the father. They loved their toys. When the heavenly father wanted to have fellowship with them, they were sort of ignoring him. Father walks into the room and they're playing with their toys. He says, hey kids, want to come over here and get a hug? They ignore him. They play with their toys. Lord Jesus walks into the room and says, Hey, children, I loved you and died for you. They ignore him, played with their toys. Well, they had toys. It tells us here that they were rich, and from history we know that Laodicea was a big banking center. These were wealthy people. It was a church that had a lot of money. They thought that they were very nicely clothed because they had black wool. That was one of the big products at Laodicea. Jesus says you're naked. Laodicea was known for the Phrygian salve that was produced there that could help heal eye disease and cure infections of the eyes. They were proud of that. Probably some of them in that church owned eye salve businesses. Jesus says you're blind. What do you think it would be like if you're walking through downtown Philadelphia and you see a naked man who is totally blind and yelling to everybody, I am better than you. Well, you probably wouldn't see him long because what would happen? The police would come and lock him up and put some clothes on him, put him in an insane asylum or something or run him through a whole battery of psychological tests. Jesus says the entire church was that way. They're all coming to church, all dressed up, all looking nice, all have a lot of money, all throwing gold into the plate. They thought they knew everything. They had all the Gnostic secrets. Jesus says, you don't get it. When I see that church gathered together, what I see is a bunch of naked people 
What I see is a bunch of blind people with gooey sores running out of their eyes. And you don't even know it. That's the pathetic thing. A church can be in such a bad condition, they don't even know they're in a bad condition. They think they're okay. But everybody else around knows they're in a bad condition. They needed white robes. They needed to be clothed. Only Jesus could clothe them. We find that they're very much like Sardis. They said they were rich, increased with goods, had need of nothing, but they were naked. You know, it's interesting, at Sardis, we find they were also wearing designer clothes, but they had at least a few in Sardis that were okay in the eyes of Jesus. Laodicea had none. Revelation 3, 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. We've already talked about how there are a lot of parallels between Philadelphia and Laodicea. He was true in Revelation 3.17. The character quality of Christ mentioned to Philadelphia is also seen in the letter to the church at Laodicea down in verse 14. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The Gospels clearly testify that Jesus is the source of truth. We see that in John chapter 1, verses 14 and following. We saw that the letter at church of Philadelphia quotes Isaiah 22, 22 concerning three things. He who opens the key of David, he who opens and no man shuts, he who shuts and no man opens. That's in Isaiah 22. But the letter to the church at Laodicea also mentions a closed door. This time the closed door is in the context of fellowship, not merely a closed or open door in terms of outreach. In Philadelphia, Jesus was going to open the door for outreach. <laughs> we come to Philadelphia, and he's not on the inside opening the door out. He's on the outside knocking on a closed door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's not standing inside and knocking, hoping they'll let him out. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. You say, well, couldn't Jesus have forced the door open? Of course he could. Jesus could easily have done that if he chose to do so. But he's giving the church at Laodicea the opportunity to make a decision, to make a choice. Now, we know from the sovereignty of God that all things are planned. Not a sparrow falls without your father. The very hairs of your head are numbered. But when we are dealing in time and space, we are presented with choices. And we make choices based on either doing right or wrong. We each have knowledge. The Word of God has been given to us so that we might know and understand. The Holy Spirit gives us illumination. He helps us to understand the Scriptures. And then God gives us a choice what we're going to do with it. He can force the door open if he wants so that there is great outreach of the gospel and many come to Christ. He can close the door too so that there's no more outreach. And those things he does by his sovereign power. Open, close. But when we get the door at the church in Laodicea, all he does is he stands outside and knocks. Inside, they can hear. Inside, we can hear.
We can move quickly to the door. We can move slowly to the door. We can stand on the other side of the door and touch our nose to the door. And he still doesn't come in for fellowship. I hope you get that picture. The church at Laodicea, so much very like the modern American church that focuses on everything except Jesus Christ. They focus on social justice. They focus on a good time. They focus on informality. They focus on fog machines and strobe lights and loud guitars and people crooning on stage and wiggling just like as if they were going to go see Elvis Presley or whoever is currently popular. But they don't focus on Jesus. Christ's invitation to open the door for fellowship indicates that the church at Laodicea was a church of believers, but they were out of fellowship. Those in fellowship become hot for Christ. Fellowship is one of the key requirements of the Christian life. And I'm not just talking about fellowship with each other. Without fellowship, a church will grow lukewarm. I'm talking about fellowship with Christ. It's true we are to exhort one another to love and to good works. When we have fellowship with other believers, there is a bond that draws us together, but it focuses on Christ. Fellowship is more than cookies and red Kool-Aid. Before Christian fellowship with one another, first we have to have fellowship with Christ. He has to be inside the door. Without being irreverent, it's more than a passing high to him as we walk by the water cooler at work while he's taking a drink. Fellowship with Christ is a lifestyle. Fellowship with Christ is the first key to spiritual growth. You can do all the other things, but if you're not in fellowship with Christ, you will not grow spiritually no matter how many mechanics you go through, no matter how many workbooks you work through, no matter how many sermons you hear. You have to be in fellowship with Christ. If he's not inside, your heart having fellowship, now he, you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you, Christ lives in you, but in terms of your will, in terms of your choices, in terms of your decisions, there's sometimes a closed door. And you know it. And you know that you make choices that you should not have made just because you didn't feel good or just because you didn't think it was important. Level one is fellowship with Christ. That's the first key to spiritual growth. Laodicea had lost it. They were saved, but totally carnal. So how do we go about growing spiritually? Remember I talked about the baby and how fun they were when they were babies. Little two-year-old comes up in his diapers and. Abba, Abba wants me to pick him up and hold him. He put their arms around my neck. I remember how many precious moments there were when my little kids expressed their love that way. Came running up, and I'd pick them up, and they'd throw their arms around my neck, and they'd say, Abba, I love you. I remember when Judy died. At that point, we had already, Daniel and Anastasia had already adopted two little Chinese boys. When they adopted them, those little boys were about two years old. And they were brought to the States. They didn't speak much English, almost none. I was with them on that trip, and I remember those two funny little guys. And, you know, they were sort of hesitant around me, and they were sort of hesitant around Daniel and Stas, but they knew that this was supposed to be their daddy and mommy. And then a couple of years later, Judy went to heaven. And after the service, and those little boys were here, little Jen Ho came running up to me, round, smiling face, 
and he grabbed me around the legs and he said grandpa I love Jesus incredible he's growing and you know what he still loves Jesus he knows a lot more and he knows that because he loves Jesus he has to obey daddy and mommy and he knows because he loves Jesus he has to be kind to his little brothers and he knows because he loves Jesus he's gonna go to Sunday school every week and he's gonna learn more about Jesus and he tells other kids about Jesus Oh, he can't preach a sermon yet. But he's growing spiritually because he loves Jesus and he's in fellowship with Jesus. How sad it would be if he got to be 18 or 19 years old and he's still running around in diapers and saying, I love Jesus, but it has made no change in his life. I suppose if you'd ask the people at Laodicea, you love Jesus? Oh, they say, oh yeah, of course we love Jesus. So how has it changed your life? If you see no change, it means you don't love Jesus. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can babble it with your mouth all you want, but the way you live tells whether or not you love Jesus. You can talk about Jesus till you're blue in the face and tell everybody how much theology you know, but if it hasn't changed your life, you don't love Jesus. You're not in fellowship with Jesus. You're not walking with Jesus day by day. You're not looking to him constantly for your guidance and your strength and your source of living the Christian life. It's a lifestyle. Laodicea had lost it. They were totally carnal. So how do we go about growing spiritually our entire lives without at some point reaching a plateau where we become stagnant? Many people have been a Christians a long time, but they have never grown spiritually. You know, we can outline, and I see my time is up. So Lord willing, I start here next week. We can outline spiritual growth through a series of steps. I'll just give you the first one. The believer's new life begins at the moment of salvation. That's spiritual birth. That's John 3. You must be born again or you must be born from above. The new life is received by faith in Christ as personal Savior. And I've got a lot of verses listed under that. The believer is the one who receives the new birth. Nobody else. The second thing we'll see next week, the Lord willing, is spiritual growth comes next. Spiritual growth is not optional. Did you know the Bible commands you to grow spiritually? The Bible commands you not to be in the state of Laodicea. Spiritual growth is commanded by God. It's accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to Him and follow His direction. There are specific means that the Holy Spirit uses for spiritual growth. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. I want to give you some verses that support each of these different things. There are seven of them whereby we're told not only that God commands it, but how God accomplishes it. And what are the results in the life of someone who has made a decision not just to believe on Jesus, but to follow Jesus. Who has made a decision not to be like Laodicea, but has made a decision to be hot or cold. How do you know when you've done that? Lord willing, we pick that up next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Father, help us not to be arrogant or proud. Help us not to fume and fuss and cross our arms and say, well, I'm a good Christian. I've been a Christian a long time. And I, I do this and I do this and I do this. Help us to learn the humility that Jesus says they must have. He told the church at Laodicea. They thought they had everything. And he said, you don't even know that you're blind and naked and wretched and poor. Father, we pray that you'd open our eyes. That we would not be blind. 
we might understand that what really clothes us is the righteousness of Christ, not our own good works. With that, we have wretched, naked rags. Father, cause us to be a people who have fellowship with Jesus, who do not close our hearts to him when he knocks at the door. And we think we've got everything. Let the traveling salesman go away. But it's not a traveling salesman. It's Jesus. Father, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.